Author and controversial filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza is back with a new movie. It takes aim at Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party, and he's my guest on this edition of Politics. Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King. He's been described as an influential conservative thinker. He's a best-selling author, political commentator, and filmmaker who's quite accustomed to navigating controversies surrounding his work. He's Dinesh D'Souza, and his latest film is Hillary's America, The Secret History of the Democratic Party. It's based on this book. Are you saying you're talking about the party of Roosevelt, right? Are you taking on Franklin yes, Delano I'm, Roosevelt I, I, and yeah. Woodrow Wilson? I, I mean, I'm taking on... And going further back as well, we, we start off with Andrew Jackson. We take on the Democrats who supported slavery in the 1850s. We take on the Democrats who tried to block women's suffrage. We take her on Woodrow, you know, Wilson, FDR, Lyndon Johnson, uh, all the way forward to Obama and, and Hillary. Do you take on any Republicans who uh, voted against civil rights, who uh, seem to be no, more we, the, we, we point the Democratic out Party is the party of civil rights now? Well, uh, remember, uh, Larry, that the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which was kind of the landmark civil rights bill of the 1960s, it is true that Barry Goldwater, who was the Republican nominee that year, opposed it. But more Republicans voted for that Civil Rights Act than Democrats did. And the main opposition to the 64 Civil Rights Act came from Dixiecrat Democrats, so Democrats in the South who were blocking Lyndon Johnson's effort to get that legislation through. Uh, Dinesh, before the premiere of Hillary's America in Hollywood, you said that if you had to pick a genre for the film, it would be horror. Why? I, I think what... I think what I meant is that, you know, we're, we often hear about the horrors of American history, uh, going back to slavery and segregation, uh, lynching, Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, forced sterilization, uh, sympathy in America for fascism in the 1930s, uh, the internment of the Japanese in World War II. Now, usually when the progressives point out these horrors, they say, look, the South did them, or the Republican Party did them, or America did them. And what I try to show is that these horrors of America history were perpetrated not by America, they were actually per uh, perpetrated by the Democratic Party. Uh, a really good example of, is the Ku Klux Klan, which was the terrorist wing of the Democratic Party uh, for 40 years. You don't think the party has outgrown that? Well, I think that the party has outgrown it in the sense that obviously no one is going around lynching people in the obvious way today. That obviously doesn't happen. But here's what I mean. Um, many of the same problems that the Democrats inflicted upon minorities in the past, they inflict on them today. Uh, if you walked through inner city Oakland or Detroit or Dallas, these places where you have these urban shootings, in some ways you can say that the Democratic plantation is boiling over. And what I mean is they've created horrible lives for the people people who live in there. Uh, there's, there's no hope, there are no jobs, there's no opportunity, the family structure is broken down, horrible levels of crime and violence. So it, you almost get PTSD living in those areas. Now remember, these areas of America are democratic all the way down. Democratic mayors, democratic city officials, democratic school superintendents. So who's going to take the responsibility for these things if not the Democratic Party? Aren't the Dixiecrats of yesterday the Republicans of today in the South? No. Uh, the Dixiecrats, uh, and in the movie Hillary's America, we actually make a list of these guys, and, and I uh, went through this list and studied it with some care. There are one or two Dixiecrats, notably Strom Thurmond, who was one of the founders of the Dixiecrat movement, uh, and later he did become a Republican, although he wasn't using the same rhetoric as he did as a Dixiecrat. But here's the point. The vast majority of Dixiecrats never switched. They remained in the Democratic Party. So this whole notion of a switch in which racist Democrats became became Republicans, you couldn't even name five of them. Is the South Republican today? It, it is, but uh, and you this don't is think a subject that that's been studied. you do with race? 
No, in fact, I think it's the opposite. When the South was really racist in the early part of the 20th century, it was monolithically Democrat. Now, if you, there are surveys that look at, a, at the decline of racism in the South, and it's been really dramatic. And here's the interesting thing. You can almost plot an inverse chart. As the South becomes less and less and less racist, it becomes more and more and more Republican. So it's the non-racists in the South who are voting for the Republican Party, and the hardcore racists have always remained Democrats. We have a clip from the film Hillary's America. Let's watch. Author Peter Schweitzer thinks otherwise. He's been investigating the Clinton Foundation. It seems, Peter, that there has been an element of gangsterism in politics. But the Clintons, they have taken gangsterism to a completely new level. They've taken it to a global level, and they put it on steroids in a massive way that's unprecedented in American history. The Clintons have a fabulously powerful and successful political machine. And part of it is, as Bill Clinton said during the first election, you get me, you get two for the price of one. And that's really the way they operate. It's a tag team mechanism. My husband, who I'm going to put in charge of revitalizing the economy, because, you know, he knows how to do it. And While Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, the Clintons took tens of millions of dollars that ended up in their pockets and hundreds of millions of dollars that ended up in the Clinton Foundation from foreign entities at precisely the time she is making decisions that affect those foreign actors. So this is unprecedented in American history. Will you continue to give speeches? Oh, yeah. I, I got to pay our bills. In the course of doing the film based on your book, what surprised you the most? Well, what surprised me the most is as I was studying slavery, which I had always thought of as purely a North-South issue, and obviously the South seceded, and obviously the Civil War ended slavery. But what struck me was that most Southerners did not own slaves. Most people who fought on the Confederate side did not own slaves. Uh, and conversely, the Northern Democrats, led by Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois, protected slavery. So slavery was actually much more complex. It wasn't just a North-South issue. It was an issue really that was more between the pro-slavery Democratic Party and the anti-slavery Republican Party. We'll be right back with the always outspoken Dinesh D'Souza. Don't go away. The film begins with you serving time in a correctional facility for violating campaign finance law. I have you, where is, what's the status of that right now, Dinesh? Basically, I've served eight months of overnight confinement in a confinement center or halfway house under the supervision of the Bureau of Prisons of the Obama administration. Uh, I am now doing the, I have five years of community service, so I'm still fulfilling that requirement. But I, I don't shy away from any of this. I put it right in the movie. And part of my point is I try to turn the lemon into lemonade by learning something in my confinement. I was obviously with seasoned and hardened criminals, many of whom had served quite long prison sentences, and I learned something about, from them, about broken American dreams, about gangs, about racketeering. Some of those lessons, by the way, quite applicable to politics. You claim in the film that several instances where the Clinton trade favors for funds to foreign governments. Can you give me an example? Yes, uh, there is a, this is documented in a book called Clinton Cash in excruciating detail, but uh, it's also been supported by reporting in the New York Times, the Washington Post, many other places. Many foreign governments have poured large amounts of money into the Clinton Foundation. And not, not only that, many American companies that had decisions, trade deals before the State Department when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State were funneling money into the Clinton Foundation, money before, and then if they get what they want, more money to follow and then uh, excessive uh, speech money to Bill Clinton. So there's a kind of very uneasy kind of collaboration between the two Clintons, one guy collecting the money and the other person performing the official favors. It's a quite a seedy arrangement. You recently said that Hillary Clinton wants to be the mob boss of America. What, what do you mean? Well, if we look back in American history, we have these histories of uh, sort of urban bosses. A really good example was Boss Tweed at the, in Tammany Hall in New York, or even uh, Richard Daly in Chicago. These are sort of urban machines that run the whole town like a racket. They, they rob the treasury. They give contracts to their own friends. Uh, Al Capone, even though a mobster, was closely tied in with the Democratic machine in Chicago. And here's my point. The Clintons are just taking this racket to the national 
and even the global level. So we've never seen anything like this before in American politics, where one spouse is the Secretary of State, the other is the ex-president. They're doing favors not only for American um, uh, corporations and individuals, but foreign governments. So they've taken, I think, uh, uh, the idea of the urban city boss and applied it to the whole of America. Racial tensions in America today. Are you concerned? And you're not blaming that on Democrats, are you? Of course not. I wouldn't say the racial tensions are, have been boiling for a while. But I do think, you know, liberals sometimes like to talk about root causes. What is actually causing things to, to boil over? And I think what I referred to earlier, which is the horrible living conditions in the inner city. Look, I, I don't sound like a conservative here, because conservatives normally just point to the guy who did it and say he was a, a black radical or he was a black Muslim or he hated the police. And what I'm saying is, no, it's more complex than that. When you put people into horrible living conditions and they can't get out and there's intergenerational poverty and you've spent trillions of dollars trying to fix the problem but these people are not a whole lot better off than they were in 1968. I do think the Democratic Party does bear some responsibility for that. In an interview with Glenn Beck in December you said if you had a bet on it the next president would be Hillary Clinton. You still say that. I, I think that she is the front runner and I say that because the Clintons have shown an unbelievable tenacity and ability to stay one step ahead of the posse. I remember that when Bill Clinton got entrapped, in, not entrapped, but ensnared in the whole Jennifer Flowers scandal of years and years ago, I thought he was done. But no, he hung in there, he staggered on, and he made it across the finish line. So I must say, I, uh, despite all my criticisms of Hillary, I admire her tenacity, and I think it's going to take a lot of creativity, intelligence, and a very powerful campaign by Trump and the Republicans. Republicans to beat her. Is there, th are there things about Trump that concern you? Uh, yes, most certainly. Uh, I think that uh, with Trump, uh, there are things I like about him. I like the fact that he's uh, politically incorrect. I like the fact that he's unashamed of having made money. I like the fact that he's good in business. Uh, I also like the fact that, uh, that Trump is going against the establishment. He's sort of uh, making some new rules in politics. I think some of the place needs to be cleaned out. Uh, on the other hand, he can be reckless with what he says. Uh, he can be, if you will, a wild man. And there's a great deal that's not known about him. So in some senses, I'm choosing between the Trump I don't know, or at least I don't <laughs> exactly know, and the Hillary I do know. More with the best-selling author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza right after this. It is my judgment. Dinesh D'Souza was sentenced on Tuesday to spend eight months in a confinement center. It all began when the Obama administration tried to shut me up. You know, gang's all about stealing, man. What did I learn? All crime is about stealing. The big criminals are still at large. Didn't uh, see any reason to keep them. The system doesn't go after them because they run the system. It's time to go behind the curtain and discover the soul of the Democratic Party. Welcome back to Politicking. You've just seen a clip from the new film, Hillary's America, The Secret History of the Democratic Party. I'm talking with the author, filmmaker, and commentator Dinesh D'Souza. His new book and the movie of the same name are out now. Dinesh joins me from Cleveland. What does it mean for America, do you think, if Hillary Clinton is the next president? Well, I think that America has been uh, moving away from, I would call it, core American ideals, at least the American ideals that I, as an immigrant, came to America to experience. Uh, I came to America because, to me, America represented a ladder of opportunity uh, up which I could climb. I wasn't looking for anyone to help me out, but I was looking for protection of my rights uh, and, and, and a country where there was opportunity to be for, for someone who's hardworking and creative and so on. Uh, so that American dream, I think, is becoming more difficult in America, not just for me. Obviously, I've been actually, I feel the American dream has worked for me. But for many people, this American dream is, has proven to be kind of a disappointment. And when I was in the confinement center, I saw a lot of people whose American dreams had been dashed and broken. So I'm not just so automatically optimistic as I used to be about the founding principles or the American ideas work for everybody. I think we have to fight for them and that my politics is based on that.
Isn't the Democratic Party the party that's more pro-immigrant than the Republicans? No, uh, no, the Republican Party has tra no, no. The, the Republican Party has traditionally always been the party of immigrants. This seems uh, very strange to say, but there have been a number of immigration restriction laws that have been passed in American history. Almost without exception, they've been passed by the Democratic Party. Now, today, it is true that Democrats are not excited about about uh, having a wall. They don't want to have identity cards. They want a fairly porous border. I think the reasons for that are cynical and political. They basically feel that if immigrants Immigrants come here from anywhere. They uh, they may not be legal, but nevertheless, if you can sign them up for government programs, they're going to become Democratic voters. So yes, I think the Democrats are pro-immigrant that way, but that's not the way that we immigrants want America to be. We we don't mind America having rules. I stood in line to become a citizen, and I and I played by the rules and played by the system. Uh, and so to me, America represents a kind of way of life that I was happy to assimilate to. But assimilation these days, bad word among the Democrats. If Hillary Clinton were president, what aspect of her presidency would concern you the most? I think what would concern me the most about Hillary would be that she would be essentially looking at the presidency as an extension of how to benefit herself and Bill and establish, if you will, a Clinton dynasty. Now, we've had, we've had dynasties in American politics, uh, FDR dynasty, to some degree, obviously, the dynasty of the Kennedys. But look, FDR was already rich when he became president. So was Kennedy. Those people aren't, didn't become president to try to rob the Treasury. By Hillary's own account, she was dead broke. The Clintons have gone from zero to $300 million at warp speed. Their foundation has over $3 billion in donations. Now, this is not because they invented the iPhone or came up with Federal Express. They've been using politics to make money and try to think of the kind of power they would have to do that if they were in, in, reinstalled in the White House. So you think her presidency would be one of gaining more money? More money and power. Once you have enough money, usually people, uh, there's a limit to how much money people want. And once they get money, they want to actually have the kind of power that has animated all kinds of rulers across the world from the beginning of time. The, the whole idea of regulating other people's lives, telling them what to do, ordering them around, there's a great human pleasure in that. Our government was set up to limit that pleasure and limit politicians from having that kind of power. Have you had any concerns about the uh, thoughts of Mike Pence? Well, I think uh, I, I know Mike Pence not well, a little bit. My sense of him is he's a solid conservative. He's a clean-cut guy. I suppose when you have two highly controversial, larger-than-life guys like Hillary and Trump running and squaring off against each other, having a somewhat uh, kind of duller man on the second uh, place on the ticket, a guy who's been married to the same woman for a long time, a guy ab about whom there are no scandals and no checkered pasts, probably a good thing. So I think this is probably a fairly solid choice. It's not my area of expertise but I'm, I'm okay with Mike Pence. More with best-selling author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza right after this. Are you concerned about what kind of president Trump would be? If he's this off the wall and I, he's this spontaneous, doesn't that concern you at all? It does, it does concern me. I mean, I would like, you know, this is, a, this is the up and down of a situation. So the upside of it is we're getting somebody who's coming in who has never been elected to any, any significant political office. In American history, that hasn't happened since Eisenhower. And he was, of course, the supreme commander of World War II. Uh, but I think American politics has become so cynical, so disenchanted with the ruling elites in the Republican as well as the Democratic Party. I mean, that's what fueled even the Bernie candidacy on the other side. I I mean, here's Bernie Sanders, a socialist. I mean, Rip Van Winkle uh, asleep for 20 years on his neighbor's couch, and he almost beat Hillary. So this tells me that on both sides of the aisle, there's a great deal of animus antagonism against the establishment, so, except in the Republican Party, that won out, and Trump became the candidate. So the good side is he comes out of nowhere, and the bad side is he comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Richard Brody, writing in The New Yorker, says that your filmmaking is propaganda that offers base innuendo in lieu of argument. How do you respond? Well, this is kind of funny, but the, the critics uh, are, whenever I release a movie, it's uniformly uh, embraced by the audience and panned by the critics. And you have to admit that the critics tend to be progressives. They're on the left. 
and many of them are intellectually unbelievably dishonest. And what I mean by that is Michael Moore can make an, a movie that's intellectually a bomb, it's, an, it's a nullity, and yet they'll say this is the greatest movie uh, since Hamlet. Uh, on the other hand, because they don't like my politics, uh, they'll say, oh, this is a horrible movie, pure agitprop. Now, we release oceans of fact in the movie. I have a supporting book of the same title with chapter and verse. None of these critics have found a single fact in the book or the movie that is erroneous in any way, and yet they use phrases like agitprop as though those phrases actually mean something. Uh, is there anything you like about the Democrats? Yes, I do. <laughs> I think the Democrats, when I, when I first came to the United States, um, I was uh, sort of welcomed by the Democratic Party. And what I mean by that is the Democrats have a more natural feel for the outsider. Uh, I, and so I was, uh, I found myself politically drawn to the Democrats at the very beginning when I first landed in America. I was just in my teens at the time. Uh, the Republican Party, in a sense, tactically, stylistically, I think is very deaf uh, and does a very bad job in trying to make its principles uh, comprehensible uh, to Latinos, to blacks, and Asian Americans. Uh, I now as part of my penance for my sins against the Obama administration, I teach uh, English to adult Hispanics, about a hundred of them. Uh, getting to know me as they do, today, if we, we were to run a poll of me against Barack Obama or me against Hillary Clinton, I seriously doubt that, that Hillary or Obama would get a single vote. But that's because they've gotten to know me. Their ideas about the Republican Party, it's a party of rich people, it's a party of fat cats, it's a party of the 1%, they don't like immigrants. So I must say the Democratic Party has done a better job of communicating with immigrants and outsiders and the Republican Party. Uh, you use a lot of the recreation process in the documentary. You do it brilliantly. It's a combination of interviews and reenactments. How much, how much can we base truth on a reenactment? Well, the reenactments are not, are not sort of, uh, they're not imaginary things. They're actually based on the historical record. And so, for example, uh, we will have, uh, I will be uh, rummaging through a box and I will find a, a tag that says property of Andrew Jackson. And then we go into that and we basically find that that same tag is worn by a slave named Betty on Andrew Jackson's plantation. Well, there actually was a slave named Betty on Andrew Jackson's plantation and she was given a horrible whipping for something, what was called her uppityness. And so we actually take the actual incident from the historical record and recreate it. The same with the Civil War, the same with the, uh, the reinvigoration of the Ku Klux Klan uh, at the behest of uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, so we're not doing, we're, our reenactments are true to life representations of actual history. Even when we show the confinement center in the movie, we couldn't use my actual confinement center, but we recreated it almost exactly. When we use the judge's words in my trial, there taken directly from the trial transcript. I have not added or subtracted anything. So there's an authenticity to this movie, and I think that's part of what is making it unnerve the left. Did you learn a lot in confinement? I did. Uh, my American dream before that was based on naivete. It was ma mainly based on books. Uh, and I would, I would look mainly at the ideals of America. I think one of the things about confinement is it showed me sort of the other America, the America I otherwise wouldn't see. Uh, I mean, I'm a conservative, but I was in an environment where you'd never meet conservatives. These are guys who are, had done time for domestic violence, drug, smuggl drug smuggling, armed robbery, uh, sometimes white collar uh, offenses as well. And I could see that many of them had no way to recover uh, from their incarceration. If you have a doctor who's you know, defrauded Medicare, he's never going to practice medicine again. And so I was able to listen to the stories of people whose American dreams have been broken. Uh, that was very eye-opening for me. Uh, did they proclaim innocence? Well, I, I got that idea from the Shawshank Redemption, and I would go into, you know, I'd go into confinement and say, hey, uh, you know, did, did you do it? Did you do it? And really, to be honest, most of them says, yeah, I, you know, I did it. Uh, as I did, by the way. I, I did exceed the campaign finance limit. I didn't mean to break the law. I didn't mean to commit a felony. I certainly didn't mean to risk incarceration. I would have been insane. I, I did this without any hope of gain to help a college friend of mine. So, but I found that these guys basically admit what they did. They, they agree that they are guilty, but 
that I should say many of them think that they are the small fry, that there are bigger fry, and I, I would count myself, Hillary, in this number, who do much worse stuff and never get caught. And the system doesn't go after them in part because they control the system. They've got unbelievable connections in the system that make sure that they are to some degree above the law. Do you think you were the victim of selective prosecution? Yes, uh, and I say that based upon this. Uh, number one, there is no one in American history who did what I did and has been prosecuted the way I has, I, I was, uh, or that has been locked up for any period of time. The only people that they go after typically are people who have, who have corruption, people who are using money to try to buy political offices, bribe a judge, try to get themselves appointed to a committee, get some tariff against their business removed. Uh, the government in this case didn't even allege corruption against me, and yet they put dozens of FBI agents on my case. They're reading through my tax returns. They try to get my assistant to wear a wire. You think I was Al Capone? A couple of other things, Dinesh. What do you think is going to happen in the debates? Uh, the debates are going to be massively interesting and entertaining. We've got two of the most, uh, the biggest gunslingers in American <laughs> politics. The one thing I say about Trump is he's not intimidated by Hillary. And so Hillary, I think, will have to watch. Normally, she could play the woman card and expect a Romney or a Bob Dole or McCain to run for the exit. That's not going to happen with Trump. So I'm looking forward to the debates. But he's got to be careful about hammering a woman too much, don't you think? You don't I want to create agree. empathy. I think it's going to... I, I agree. This is a case where you need... Uh, Hillary needs the, 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 the votes of men and Trump needs the votes of women. Dinesh, always great talking with you. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. Dinesh D'Souza, the book Hillary's America, the film Hillary's America, the secret history of the Democratic Party. The book and the movie are out now. Thanks for joining me on this edition of Politicking. Remember, you can join the conversation on my Facebook page. You can check out the Politicking blog on our homepage or tweet me at King's Things. And don't forget, use the Politicking hashtag. And that's all for this edition of Politicking.